by way of context before we start with our, with our panelists, you know, films have been making an impact since they've begun. And I think it's really interesting to just, you know, think about that for a sec. Um, you know, when we think about um, Birth of a Nation, D.W. Griffith's film in 1915 is credited actually with um, reviving the KKK, which had disbanded by 1869 and then in the 1920s, uh, its membership swelled again to four million. And the idea among many scholars is that Birth of a Nation really revived this, this passion for the KKK. Um, Triumph of the Will, you know, um, Lenny Riefenstahl's film is credited with building a cult of personality around Hitler and creating unanimous support among Germans for, for Hitler's policies. Okay, so that's on one side. And then you start to look at Harlan County, Barbara Koppel's film, 1976, which um, is, you know, apparently, Again, scholars believe it really helped miners around the country, not just in Harlan County, gain awareness of what they needed to secure their, their safe working conditions. Moving on to um, Errol Morris's A Thin Blue Line, 1988, um, the acquittal of uh, Randall Dale Ad Adams because his film revealed new, new information and the perjury of various witnesses in his case. Philadelphia in um, 1993, um, uh, Tom Hanks, kind of, rate, you know, because he's kind of the inimitable, he's the he's the like impenetrable man next door playing a gay man with AIDS. His presence in the film really shifts awareness around the country about AIDS and what it means to be an AIDS patient. Um, Rosetta, the Dardenne brothers, Belgian film of 1999, which inspired, which was about a young girl who is homeless and is working for under minimum wage and can't make ends meet, inspires a new law in Belgium um, that prohibited employers from paying teenage workers anything less than the minimum wage. Um, Super Size Me, 2003. Um, you know, after this film, Morgan Spurlock, apparently, you know, less, fewer than six weeks after the release of, of Super Size Me, McDonald's discontinues the supersize option at all of its locations. And then Inconvenient Truth, 2005, and we'll talk more about that, but I think we all are aware that, that this film created a wildfire of awareness about global climate change. So with that, I just wanted to set a little bit of context, and yet in the last decade, we've seen this incredible explosion of a kind of new appetite among um, American audiences for work that penetrates the gripping and intractable social issues of our time. So um, I'm going to ask each of you just to quickly talk, talk about your work and what you do and the organization that, that you are a part of. Want to start, Sarah? Sure. Sarah Newman. <laughs> Sarah Newman from Participant Media. Uh, sure. So I'm in the social action department at Participant Media. Um, I think we're the only film company that I know of that actually has a social action department. Um, and I'm in charge of doing the research for all of our campaigns, um, developing initiatives, and then also working on the execution of the social action campaign. Uh, there's eight people currently in my department that I work with as well on these things. And then we also work very closely with our digital department and our marketing department to, to uh, execute the campaigns. What, can you name some of the films that, you, that Participant Media has been responsible sure. for? Sure, An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, Syriana, Good Night and Good Luck, um, Food Inc., most recently uh, Contagion, uh, The Help, um, Find North. <laughs> um, so a lot of um, narrative and documentary films that um, over the past seven plus years that have garnered strong awards, theatrical releases, um, done well at the box office. Great. Sheila Letty from the Fledgling Fund. Good morning, everyone. I'm the executive director of the Fledgling Fund, and we are a private foundation that works at the intersection of film and social change, actually founded by um, a former faculty member at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Business School. But we really look at um, that point in the film, shaping campaigns around it. So we don't actually fund the production of film, but those engagement campaigns where we can move people from kind of passive viewers to active participants in a movement. Again, I like to, t I sometimes tell filmmakers, we don't fund film, we fund social change. And there are some films that are just natural vehicles for that. And we work really closely with our grantees to try and figure out what it is they need at different points in the process to help them move forward. And sometimes that might be a small planning grant um, very early, which is what we did with Finding North when they were, I don't even think they were in production yet 
those are kind of rare, but for those really compelling stories, um, we will do those little seed grants to more um, in-depth and larger grants um, around larger campaigns that require both funding as well as in-kind, um, a little bit of what we did with um, the Bully Project. So, but the focus on all of it is on that outreach and audience engagement, so moving beyond distribution to really engaging people in a movement. That's great. Patricia Finneran. Great. Um, well, I work currently for um, the Sundance Institute, um, as Caroline does, um, but I work on our documentary film program, which is um, one of the largest funders of contemporary social justice documentaries in the world. Um, so it's been around for about 10 years, and um, we funded about, I think we just, 532 films was what we, when we celebrated it at Sundance this year. And we focus, we fund films at development, production, and and most recently also in the area of impact and outreach. Um, so there are always films that are creative feature length documentaries. Um, we value that experience and we can talk about that of that experience of people coming together to see a film in a space together. Um, acknowledging that many documentaries are actually seen on television but there's sort of this value to the feature length film and the, and the viewing experience. Um, as part of my work at Sundance, I've been working on a partnership that was created by our director um, at, at the Sundance Doc Fund, Kara Murtis, in partnership with the Skoll Foundation, which is um, a leading foundation for social entrepreneurship. And I oversee um, a project where we funded about 10 documentaries about social entrepreneurship and a series of convenings around um, the infl inf influx or the um, integration between social entrepreneurship and social change documentary and story. Um, so, sorry this is taking so long, but no. sort of the next iteration of my life is sort of so, part of where wrong. we are. So, <laughs> I've been doing this for years and worked in film for years, and I'm in the middle of sort of transitioning, still as a consultant at Sundance, working on this Stories of Change series, um, which is about social entrepreneurship and documentary. And actually, in the work I've done, I've just gotten really excited about the um, work that's happening in terms of impact. So. I've now actually um, taken on a consulting capacity working on a film that the Fledgling Fund supported um, called The Bully Project, or called Bully now. And um, so I can talk a little bit about that, but I think yeah. that there's um, really a moment happening about um, building out this space around, around documentary and social change. Yeah, great. So we're gonna go to the question, which is the t also the eponymous title of this panel, which is, what is impact anyway? Um, and I. Sheila Letty and Diana Barrett at the Fledgling Fund have done really groundbreaking work in articulating what does, what, how can we start to, frameworks for how can we start to think about film and impact? How can we, what are rubrics that really help us define dimensions of what that impact can look like? And I was wondering, Sheila, if you could kind of walk us through a couple of those models that have, that have helped all of us start to think about how to structure these campaigns. Sure, so when Fledgling first started um, really thinking about this space, we were also in a little bit of, we were doing some community funding as well. So we really felt like we need to understand why intuitively we feel so strongly about funding film and what is it that we think it can accomplish and then how are we gonna measure and track our work so we can begin to figure out if we're, we're making the right choices with projects and our funding is having an impact. Because um, we did need to be accountable to our board as well. And through that, we did a lot of research and we talked to a lot of filmmakers and folks in the industry about what they had done. And we kind of laid out a model um, that was really helpful for us and I think for filmmakers as well to begin to think about impact. And we laid it out along dimensions of impact. And at the center is the core, it's the story, it's the film. And it, it needs to be, and, and that's kind of tough to, to think about what makes a good film, mm -hmm. but that was kind of the core, like we had to be moved and compelled by a story. And we kind of laid out some metrics to go around that, um, looking at festival acceptance, critical reviews, um, mm -hmm. did it secure a broadcast? And again, it was a way of saying, is this film of high enough quality that it's gonna have viewership and people are gonna wanna go see it and, and sit through it and, and be immersed in the experience of the film? Then we moved down to, so you start with the story at the core, and you move out to public awareness, which again is, is kind of how many people are gonna see the film and learn about the film through press coverage. The next one is where we kind of get more, a little more excited. So we're less excited necessarily about just filling seats, but really how do we then increase public engagement? How do we move someone from a passive viewer to a more active um, participant in an issue? Whether that's learning more, 
whether it's coming to a panel discussion after a film, going to a website, signing a petition, something that actually moves you to do something so that when the lights come up, you begin to think, what can I do? You see the small act, a small act, and you say, my God, I want to help. What can I do? And maybe that's giving a donation. Maybe it's finding more, but maybe it's doing something in your own community. But again, it's that public engagement, and can we start to identify measures of that? And we've kind of laid out some sample measures, but I think it's important to say for each film, it's different depending on the goals. Mm. The next level we look at is um, strengthening a movement. And by that we mean, is this a film that is going to help nonprofits and activists and, and social activists, social entrepreneurs on the ground do their work better? Is it going to help them advocate for change? Is it going to build collaboration among organizations? Is it going to strengthen perhaps the organization that the film is about? I think if you look at a small act, you could say that it helps strengthen the foundation mm -hmm. and build more awareness of it, as well as probably increase, for some organizations, it might be kind of increasing membership. And then beyond that, it's kind of that social change goal. Sometimes that's a policy change, um, and we've seen that with some of our films. Um, sometimes it's, it's longer term, and you're looking at kind of interim measures. Um, of have we changed the public conversation? Have we, have we gotten a film in front of the policymakers that need to see it in order to make a change? And I think with, with all of it, we recognize that social change is a really long process mm -hmm. and that one film is not necessarily going to go from start to finish, but can we move an issue along um, that continuum and can a film, depending on where an issue is, help move us along. And can we define that goal and then see, you know, do we think it's, is it awareness that we need for this issue? Or do we have awareness? Right now we need some engagement and we need some organizations to step up and really be pulled together to kind of form a movement. Mm -hmm. It's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, I want to talk to Sarah and, and Patricia about a couple of campaigns that <coughs> obviously they're very engaged with activating these campaigns, implementing these campaigns. And Sarah, can you talk about, um, for example, Food Inc., a, a, a campaign that you have recently completed, um, and talk about it in terms of this, these, this framework that Sheila describes of awareness, engagement, social movement, social change. And I find, Sheila, your, your definition of sort of these, these, these kind of, this kind of process that we can go through to kind of, again, help shape a campaign, defining clear goals based on mm -hmm. where the issue is in society. How did you guys approach that at Participant Media when you were looking at Food Inc.? Where was the issue, you know, at that point? And how did you define your goals? And what did the campaign look like? Yeah. And I should add that it's still ongoing. Okay. I'm a little obsessed with Food Inc., so I'm still working on it. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> How did so, you begin to think about it at the beginning? Um, so we always begin our social action campaigns, the research phase at least, um, usually at least a year or two before the film is released theatrically. So um, I started working on Food Inc. in terms of doing research um, about a year plus before the movie came out. That involved talking to experts, reading books, um, talking with nonprofit leaders, um, just following a range of issues in the media, um, talking with the filmmakers, but not fully knowing exactly what the film will look like, but just having a sense of here are key groups that we could be working with, here are key issues. Um, and the timing of the film was really impeccable because um, it was released around the same time that there was this national legislation called the Child Nutrition Reauthorization, which happens once every five years in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I talked to a lot of these advocacy groups in DC, they always just kept talking about this Child Nutrition Reauthorization. So pretty early on, we had a sense we need to do something around this Child Nutrition Reauthorization. What was that? What is that? So um. that is um, a federal piece of legislation that's reauthorized every five years. It's billions of dollars, and it provides the funding for all uh, federal nutrition programs. So that includes school lunches, okay. breakfasts, uh, snacks, everything. Everything that a child eats in school is determined by this legislation. Um, so we. Um, 
after seeing the movie, we decided that the target audience really needs to be moms. Um, and it's not that all other demographics don't matter. It's just that we felt that we want to build a campaign really centered on moms, but also provide supporting initiatives that are for a broader audience. And so it really dovetailed well with a demographic of moms, child nutrition reauthorization, working on school lunches, and we worked with a group that was focused on removing soda and junk food from all federally funded nutrition programs. So eliminating vending machines, not serving junk food at lunches, things like that. Um, but just to back up on the, I think you first said awareness, one of the things that we always say at Participant is that seeing the movie is a social action and that just getting people to see the movie is a step in terms of having them understand the issue, possibly becoming engaged, changing their own behaviors. Um, so getting people to the theaters or seeing it on DVD is always something that in the social action department we actually really push. So we have a marketing department and we work very closely with them on getting people just to see the movie. Um, and then in terms of engagement, we always develop a range of initiatives to meet people where they're at, as we like to say. And so for a movie like Food Inc., some people um, wanted to radically change the way they're eating. Some people wanted to become farmers. And other people just wanted to sign a petition. So we always offer a lot of different um, resources and ways for people to become engaged to um, meet their level of interest and their, their comfort level. Um, but our really big initiative on the campaign was this child nutrition reauthorization. We had a petition on the website that garnered 250,000 signatures. We um, hold it a, uh, held a lobby day in DC. We brought in about 100 moms from across the country to celebrities, met with congressional leaders, um, continued to send letters to members of Congress. And um, it was December of 2010 that the legislation finally passed. So the movie came out in June 2009, and throughout that entire time, we we're still working on this child nutrition reauthorization. Um, and now the film is obviously been on DVD and broadcast and so forth, and the film is now what we call in a legacy phase. So we're still uh, working on it. Um, we still have email updates and a really robust Facebook community. It's not as engaged. Um, we're not doing as many initiatives as we were at the theatrical release, but there's such a strong community around it now, and it's become, in a sense, bigger than the film. And it's really the community of Food Inc. that's inspired by the film, but not just tied to the film. So we're still doing lots of different way, uh, engagements. And so now there's a new piece of legislation, the Farm Bill. Same type of thing. Once every five years, hundreds of billions of dollars also really determines what people eat. And so now we've been trying to figure out internally how we can be involved in the Farm Bill. And the, and, it, and the story continues, And right? the story continues, yeah. so, yeah. and... Um, Can I talk quickly about the Lear Center? Yeah, please. So really quickly, okay. sorry. We um, did a study with the Lear Center, which is based at USC, and it was to understand how the film changed people's lives. And it was led by Johanna Blakely, who's the director there, and it was um, really phenomenal. We had 36,000 people fill out the survey, which is just unheard of and off the charts. and um, They scrubbed the data and they still had a pool of 15,000 people. And um, to summarize the conclusion, the majority of people who saw Food Inc. said the movie changed their life. We had open-ended questions and people went into great detail talking about the personal behaviors that have changed, um, how they've gotten involved in the community, in the schools, in politics, things like that. And it really not only was a sense of validation about the film and the campaign, but it really was insightful because it um, helped us understand what issues resonated with people and the issues that they really were most passionate about. And that um, information is now used in this legacy phase of the campaign. Great. Um, and so Pat Patricia, will you talk, she, you're engaged currently with 
a campaign for the bully, the bully project now yeah. called Bully. Yeah. Um, being released by Weinstein Brothers. When does it? When is the release? March thirtieth. March thirtieth. So you're so, in the mix, right? You're in the we're in, in the, the eye of the storm. The midst of it. Yeah, I'm so in the midst of it. I'm like, ooh, where do I begin? Um, but. <laughs> Um, just a small campaign. It's a <laughs> tiny little campaign. So, so actually just, there's two, we, we talked, how many of you have seen the film A Small Act that we were talking about earlier? Have any? So, oh, fantastic. Okay. So A Small Act is an education film, you could call it that, and Bully is also a film in education. And I think what's helpful for me anyway is to think about sort of categories and then, then you look at categories of films, you look at audiences, defining your audience, achieving specific goals, right? So A Small Act, um, for those of you who haven't seen it, is essentially a film about a young man who, um, whose education is paid for while he's a young man in Kenya. Um, the woman that paid for it he never knew was a woman named Hilda Bach up in Sweden who turns out to have been a Holocaust survivor. He gets this education, he comes to Harvard, and he becomes a human rights attorney. So the circle of the story is kind of phenomenal. But the core of the film, actually, when you experience the film, is actually the story, because that already happened, right? So it's a great story, and I told it to you, and you've heard it now. But the movie is actually about these kids, and they're waiting to find out whether or not they get the scholarship. So when you experience this film, you're really tied to these kids. And Chris Mburu is the leader, but what actually makes the movie work is that you have an emotional connection with these young kids and you want to make sure that they get the scholarship. And you think, wow, they didn't get it because there wasn't enough money. If there was more money, wow, more kids could get the scholarship. So when the film showed at the Sundance Film Festival, back to my point of people seeing it in a shared experience, mm -hmm. people get this energy in the room and a donation of $100,000 was made during the festival. They've now raised over a million dollars for that film. So raised awareness around this, this notion of the need for better funding for education, raise this notion that a lot of, all of us feel when we see the movie of, wow, one act can make a difference and the power of that, and then actually change lots of lives in terms of what's happening in Kenya in education in a really specific, measurable way, mm -hmm. which is, which is kind of great. Mm -hmm. um, That's a very measurable impact <laughs> campaign. Yeah, which is, you know, which is fantastic. And also, one of the things we've been talking about the last couple days is the unintended consequences thing of like, who knew that would happen? Yeah. So I'm now working on a film called Bully. Um, and this film is, um, takes place primarily in, in Sioux City, Iowa, and in Tennessee. It's a story of sort of one year inside the bullying crisis in America. And um, the filmmaker is, really extraordinary and really embedded himself in, these, in this community. And it is the story of five different stories, um, two families who lost a child to suicide, um, and different children who experience bullying and the reaction. And it doesn't lay out solutions, it lays out an experience, and it leaves you, the audience, to draw a conclusion. Um, so I just came onto the campaign about two months ago um, where the filmmakers had already done tremendous work in this regard and now we're, we're at the point of actually activating the campaign um, or we're both developing and activating almost at the same time. But in terms of our audiences and thinking about what we want to do, um, we think about students, um, parents, educators and activists. So we wanted to think what is the interaction point for each of our audience. Um, and the other thing I would say in this particular film, we actually have a high responsibility level that, that you, when you think about what happens after people see the movie, it's very emotionally opening. And so one thing that we wanted to do, um, we've partnered with the Because Foundation and they've created, um, with the North American Association of Child Helplines, um, a new helpline and website called 121 Help Me. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do is make sure after you show the movie, there are kids that are in crisis what do they do? How do they access resources? You've suddenly opened up that space and you need to have responsibility around that. Mm -hmm. um, we're also working with the Trevor Project, which really specializes in providing um, resources to LGBTQ youth about um, when they're in crisis and responding to prevent suicide. So there's the kind of crisis responsibility. And then there's, we also wanna actually change the understanding of bullying, that it's not just kids will be kids. We want to actually get people to the point that it's not, it's a behavior that's not acceptable and we can actually change it. And our agenda around it is changing it and not zero tolerance, but changing and transforming society. So this is a big goal. Um, so some of the other things we're doing um, that you were talking about is, so raising awareness. I think people know about this problem, but we want people to see it differently. Um, and we're using partners, and ultimately it all gets back to sort of partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we're working 
we have partners within the LGBTQ community. We also are working really closely with the special needs community. Um, special needs children are bullied at a higher rate than children that aren't identified as having special needs. So we've developed a special toolkit for, um, learn for special needs groups in partnership with uh, National Center for Learning Disabilities. Um, and then we're also, there's a lot going on here, we're also providing sort of immediate inflection points for young people that just want to get involved. There's a, has anyone heard of an organization called Do Something? Yeah. So yeah. do something.org has half a million young people that follow it and it's mostly text based. Um, which gets into this issue of like, do you offer people points of intersection at all different levels? Mm -hmm. So it's text-based for young people and they text in a number that's like, I can't remember the number, but <laughs> that you'll then be on this list and you can go online and you take on the project that Do Something is doing, which is to have young people do a national census around the, the climate in their schools. Mm -hmm. um, the final thing I'll say in terms of, because there's a number of different things going on, but we're excited to also be working, um, we had a great meeting here, up here at Harvard a couple weeks ago um, to work with the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So we see the film as a tool for, as a, a point to bring people around, but ultimately a tool to um, energize the work of others and create new partnerships and collaboration. So the Harvard Grad School of Education is doing tremendous work around school climate and, and anti-bullying. And the dean there, um, Kat, um, Kathy McCarthy, is extraordinary. And so we're working with them to build um, a new series of tools that will provide parents with resources and also begin to tracking, tracking data around these issues in a new way that will ultimately, we believe, sort of give back to society in terms of being able to um, understand this issue and measure kind of what works. Mm -hmm. So just one final kind of question here, which is about this question of measurable. Actually, I have so many more questions. We could talk all day about all of this. I, as you can see, each film is, each specific story and each specific issue demands a different kind of campaign, a different set of goals, and a different set of measurements. Um, so I think that's why it's such a complex and wide yeah. open field in a way. But can, you know, you've talked about measurables. You talked about measurables in, in a small act and tracking sort of, again, the efficacy mm -hmm. of the campaign, the impact, because what is the impact? Yeah. Um, with your campaign with Bully, I mean, it's, these are really, really broad, that's a very broad horizon in terms of changing how a society um, thinks about <laughs> bullying. Um, Sheila, can you talk a little bit about sort of defining, defining the expectations of a mm -hmm. campaign and mm -hmm. the question of tracking impact and measuring mm -hmm. impact? I mean, I think, the first thing is that it's different for every campaign. I mean, these two campaigns are so comprehensive and, yeah. and big that you have multiple points that you're trying to measure and track. Right. Um, but I think that there are kind of smaller campaigns as well. But the mm -hmm. same kind of the same theory holds. You know, you you need to identify what your goals are and then figure out from the beginning how you want to track that. And I think we have to look at a mix of both numbers: how many people saw the film, how many people went to the website. How many people you know, took advantage of the do something text line or called the one to help me line? What, how did you kind of connect people to resources? But numbers. I think that's numbers, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and those metrics. And I think actually increasingly with kind of online and mobile technology that those are easier to capture than they were you know, five or 10 years ago. I think the, the issue is that you can't really stop there. I think you also need to incorporate story again because by then mm -hmm. telling more stories you then can kind of link it again, perhaps, to further action. And I think mm -hmm. you can say, oh, we had 12 screenings. But at Fledgling, we want to know, what, what did those screenings feel like? What happened? So mm -hmm. it's kind of that mix of numbers with the anecdotal, and then recognizing that sometimes you might not actually be able to measure it with a hard number. Mm -hmm. But if we can figure out what it is, what, their, what those goals are, and kind of tell some stories, it gives context to some of the numbers. I think about it when you're doing market research. Sometimes you need a survey, sometimes you need a focus group, and sometimes you need a really in-depth one-on-one interview to understand kind of one person's mm -hmm. perspective. And I think when we're talking about measuring the impact of film, it's a little bit like that. You want those numbers. How many people saw the film? Where'd they go? You want a little bit of you know, maybe a meeting with nonprofits or NGOs. How are you using the film? Can you tell me a story about how maybe it helped you make your case to Congress or to a particular subcommittee with Congress or to a policymaker in the Department of Education. Give us a sense of what that looked like and what role the film played. 
and also how you continue to use it in your work. So was it just a one-off screening, or is this a film that continues to help you? Maybe the whole film, maybe the trailer, maybe a piece of it. Great, great. Um, we have time for some questions, so I'd like to open it up for uh, maybe five questions. Can I just add a comment yes, please. that's relevant yeah. to, um, yeah. to particularly the, the Center for Public Leadership? Um, one of the things we want to do is work um, city by city, region by region. Um, so there's this ground up thing of people, you know, the trailer and, mm -hmm. and what's happening in social media, which is great. Uh, but ultimately, we need to work within school systems, right? And work within regions. And quick story, but um, an amazing uh, couple that are kind of community leaders in Cincinnati met um, the filmmaker at an American for the Arts conference. And they invited uh, Lee Hirsch, the director, and I to Cincinnati. And they put together a meeting for us to try to get kind of buy-in from the city of Cincinnati to create a program so that all the kids that are um, eighth grade and high school um, cause, uh, would see the film. And we're trying to raise money so that we can pay for them to see the film and then the buses and the whole thing. So, but you have to get sort of community level buy-in. And this was a moment when I walked into a room, there were supposed to be 12 people at this meeting and word had gotten out and there were 40 people at the meeting. And they included the superintendent of schools, um, the chief of police, um, a representative from Procter & Gamble, which is headquartered in Cincinnati, um, wow. The Catholic Archdiocese, um, a Catholic inner city school system that they educate 30% of the students in Cincinnati. Several school principals, the Boy Scouts of America, the Girl Scouts of America, um, people in charge of the anti-bullying policy, a member of the school board. Wow. And I was like, in the bus company. Oh, and the, oh, most importantly, the bus company. The bus company. The bus company. Because the bus company, actually, I needed, wow. we needed their help in getting reduced busing rates to get the kids to see the movie in the movie theater. Um, so the point of all this is, first of all, we walked into this as sort of filmmakers, and our community leaders, Tony Robinson-Smith and Edgar Smith, are just extraordinary advocates and, and public leaders who are not elected officials, but just conveners extraordinaire. And we now realize we need to work with all these different levels. And what it was an evidence for me was the sort of power of this film, or just a film and the excitement around it, mm -hmm. to draw people together that share um, a vision for how we can, we can address this issue, but maybe not the same way, and are working independently. And to bring all those people together in a room together is this movement building. And now our job mm -hmm. is to really leverage it and make it happen. But that issue around sort of public leadership um, and acknowledging as a filmmaker and a campaign person that you can't do it on your own, yeah. that you actually need partners. An, an issue like this. You need partners and you need mm -hmm. um, public partners. I love it. it sorry, go ahead. It, and I would argue that that's impact right there, just yes, getting yes. all of those yeah. people in a room. And I think that that happens with many of the films that we work, yeah. work yeah. with. And it could be a smaller gathering. It might not be 40, but it might be 10 who are working on school lunch. And all of a sudden, you've got a few people who never actually have sat across yeah. the table before that are talking about how this film is giving them an idea. Maybe not because it's showing the problem, but perhaps it's highlighting a solution yeah. that they yeah. can say, wait a minute, that's a really creative, innovative way to approach it. And how can we take a model that worked in Berkeley and see if we can do it in Boston or a model in Baltimore and take it to Cincinnati? And so I think it's also a way to share solutions and not just mm -hmm. A problem. Yeah, I think that's that's such a great point that that um, especially for this crowd, which is sort of emanating from the Kennedy School, which is about social mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and people trying to influence policy. That that film, in a way, it should be thought of as a kind of the, that sort of mysterious tool that we can mm -hmm. all access. Somehow, stories and metaphors mm -hmm. draw people together in ways that they might not be drawn together for in more in kind of when only dealing with an issue, grinding out an issue. But rather, if there's a story it, to, to kind of magnetize people together, people may, may, may convene in, in surprising and creative ways. It, it's not unlike a case study that we all use in a, in a course or in a class, because it gives you a neutral story to talk right. about. Right. And you're talking about that person or that person in a film. Yeah. Maybe not yourself, but it causes that reflection. Right. And having all of the stakeholders at different levels all together mm -hmm. is a crucial part of any campaign, it appears. Yeah. We have what we call a big tent philosophy, and we bring together a lot of stakeholders who otherwise might not be working together. Um, there's one documentary that okay. I'm working on right now, and a nonprofit called me and said, essentially, we don't work with the other nonprofits that you have listed on your website. And so I talked to her and I said, look, 
we know that all that you're not necessarily working with this group, that you have a different strategy or a different interpretation of the issues, but we bring everyone together to support the campaign and the film. Essentially put your differences aside and come to the table because everyone is going to benefit from supporting this film, from being involved in the campaign, that we're going to be driving people to supporting to support your organization. And it's been really rare, I would say, for an organization to not join a campaign because of um, differences of opinion or philosophy with another organization. But it's a really great opportunity to, to your point, to bring these groups and individuals together that otherwise yeah. aren't working together and it's maybe a subtle way of being a mediator. <laughs> yeah. Again, social movements. Um, thank you so much. Oh, I, we don't have time for questions, but oh, everyone will be around all day, so please engage with each other. Engage with, with Patricia, Sheila, and Sarah, and they're here as our experts to talk with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Fire of awareness about global climate change. So with that, I just wanted to set a little bit of context, and yet in the last decade we've seen this incredible explosion of a kind of new appetite among um, American audiences for work that penetrates the gripping and intractable social issues of our time. So um, I'm going to ask each of you just to quickly talk, talk about your work and what you do and the organization that, that you are a part of. Want to start, Sarah? Sure. Sarah Newman. <laughs> Sarah Newman from Participant Media. Uh, sure. So I'm in the social action department at Participant Media. Um, I think we're the only film company that I know of that actually has a social action department. Um, and I'm in charge of doing the research for all of our campaigns, um, developing initiatives, and then also working on the execution of the social action campaign. Uh, there's eight people currently in my department that I work with as well on these things. And then we also work very closely with our digital department and our marketing department as, to uh, execute the campaigns. What, can you name some of the films that, you, that Participant Media has been responsible sure. for? An Inconvenient Truth, uh, Syriana, Good Night and Good Luck, um, Food Inc. Most By way of context, before we start with our, with our panelists, you know, films have been making an impact since they've begun. And I think it's really interesting to just, you know, think about that for a sec. Um, you know, when we think about um, Birth of a Nation, D.W. Griffith's film in 1915, is credited actually with um, reviving the KKK, which had disbanded by 1869, and then in the 1920s, uh, its membership swelled again to four million. And the idea among many scholars is that Birth of a Nation really revived this, this passion for the KKK. Um, Triumph of the Will, you know, um, Lenny Riefenstahl's film is credited with building a cult of personality around Hitler and creating unanimous support among Germans for, for Hitler's policies. Okay, so that's on one side. And then you start to look at Harlan County, Barbara Koppel's film, 1976, which um, is, you know, apparently Again, scholars believe it really helped miners around the country, not just in Harlan County. Get when they were, I don't even think they were in production yet. Those are kind of rare, but for those really compelling stories, um, we will do those little seed grants to more um, in-depth and larger grants um, around larger campaigns that require both funding as well as in-kind, um, a little bit of what we did with um, the Bully Project. So. But the focus on all of it is on that outreach and audience engagement, so moving beyond distribution to really engaging people in a movement. That's great. Patricia Finneran. Great. Um, well, I work currently for um, the Sundance Institute, um, as Caroline does, um, but I work on our documentary film program, which is um, one of the largest funders of contemporary social justice documentaries in the world. Um, so it's been around for about 10 years, and um, we've funded about I think we just, 532 films was what we, when we celebrated it at Sundance this year. And we focus, we fund films at development, production, and, and most recently also in the area of impact and outreach. 
Um, so they're always films that are creative feature length documentaries. Um, we value that experience and we can talk about that, of that experience of people coming together to see a film in a space together. Um, again, awareness of what they needed to secure their, their safe working conditions. Moving on to um, Errol Morris's A Thin Blue Line, 1988, um, the acquittal of uh, Randall Dale Ad Adams because his film revealed new, new information and the perjury of various witnesses in his case. Philadelphia in um, 1993, um, uh, Tom Hanks kind of, you know, because he's kind of the inimitable, he's the, he's the like impenetrable man next door playing a gay man with AIDS his presence in the film really shifts awareness around the country about AIDS and what it means to be an AIDS patient. Um, Rosetta, the Dardenne Brothers Belgian film of 1999, which inspired, which was about a young girl who is homeless and is working for under minimum wage and can't make ends meet, inspires a new law in Belgium um, that prohibited employers from paying teenage workers anything less than the minimum wage. Um, Super Size Me, 2003, um, you know, after this film, Morgan Spurlock, apparently, you know, less, fewer than six weeks after the release of, of Super Size Me, McDonald's discontinues the Super Size option at all of its locations. And then Inconvenient Truth, 2005, and we'll talk more about that, but I think we all are aware that, that this film created a wild... Recently, uh, Contagion, uh, The Help, um, Finding North. <laughs> um, so a lot of um, narrative and documentary films that um, over the past seven plus years that have garnered strong awards, theatrical releases, um, done well at the box office. Great. Sheila Letty from the Fledgling Fund. Good morning everyone. I'm the executive director of the Fledgling Fund and we are a private foundation that works at the intersection of film and social change, actually founded by um, a former faculty member at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Business School. But we really look at um, that point in the film, shaping campaigns around it. So we don't actually fund the production of film, but those engagement campaigns where we can move people from kind of passive viewers to active participants in a movement. Again, I like to, I sometimes tell filmmakers, we don't fund film, we fund social change. And there are some films that are just natural vehicles for that. and we work really closely with our grantees to try and figure out what it is they need at different points in the process to help them move forward. And sometimes that might be a small planning grant um, very early, which is what we did with Finding North.